Hi, um, I'm Karen Plater and I'm Associate Secretary for Stewardship and Plan Giving and with Jen DeCombe we've been running this Many Matters course. We spent a lot of time in the fall and early winter planning it and we're so delighted to finally get to the last section know. of this and um, we have special guest with us the Reverend Kirk Summers who's going to talk about buildings but just a few housekeeping things um, a reminder that this is a webinar provided by the Presbyterian Church in Canada and it's made possible by your gifts to Presbyterian sharing so we're very grateful for congregations that support this across Canada and finally, um, just a little plug before I turn it over to Jim and Kirk, I wanted to let you know that coming this fall, we're working on additional resources that can help congregations and presbyteries who are considering options for how to develop their properties and buildings, including who are looking at new ways to provide income to support the congregations. And I know Kirk is gonna to touch on that today, but ones who are looking about talking about developing the property so it might provide affordable housing and different levels of that, or so that it might better serve the community and provide community space. So we're really grateful for Kirk for providing this foundational webinar. And then we'll, um, we're doing some surveys and gathering more information for you over the summer that we'll have ready and we'll do some more webinars and articles in the fall. So stay tuned for more on that. Okay, Jim, I am going to send this over to you and Kirk. Oh, thank you very much. Well, uh, you know, it's it's my pleasure uh, today to uh, introduce uh, Reverend Kirk T. Summers. Uh, although many on Zoom will know Kirk, um, I, he, I just wanted to say he's a devoted minister known for his unwavering faith and transformative ministry. Uh, with experience in long-term care, Kirk brings compassion and a vision for Christianity to his work. He's been serving Trinity uh, Presbyterian Church in York Mills for years now, and his, his prayerful services reflect thoughtfulness and a deep belief in God's love. And along with his wife, Nancy, and their two children, Kirk's commitment to sharing the message of grace inspires all who have the privilege of knowing him. Kirk, I, I'd like to welcome you as our guest speaker today. Jim, thank you very much. I, I'm delighted to be here, and I see the names and the faces that have come round, and I, I would want to thank all of you for participating, and um, I would like you to know that I could never do something like this without you, the church, uh, the good guidance of uh, God's love um, in so many ways empowered by the resurrected Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if I may, a huge shout out to Alberta uh, from Medicine Hat to Calgary and beyond, a huge shout out to Saskatchewan and uh, to London, Ontario, and to the good people of Knox College, my classmates, my colleagues and friends, all of you. I see you, Alberta. I see you, Saskatchewan. I see you, London. Um, I see you, Knox, and I see all of you. Thank you for your service to Christ and his church, the things that you are doing as good stewards of all that is entrusted to you, not only in the care of facilities and grounds, but the good stewardship of time and, um, and prayer. So I'm very mindful that you have cut out time in your life uh, to spend time in my life. And we do look forward to this, um, this very special moment together. I wanted to begin in our good tradition uh, with a prayer, um, certainly uh, asking for God's continued guidance as we go about uh, being the church and uh, being good stewards of everything entrusted to our care. So uh, I would, would like to pray this as one with you across the country and around the world, and a big hello to France also today. Friends in Christ, let us pray. Gracious God, by your spirit, give to all who lead and have authority and influence over others and places, the wisdom, time, and energy to govern well, care well, and vision well, seeking only what is good in your sight for the good news of your son. Amen. So, oh, so many passages in the Bible draw us to an understanding of uh, facilities and grounds and understanding of each other as we use them well to the glory of God in the service of Christ. Um, 
this one cornerstone of who we are as Presbyterians, as Christians, um, if I may share these words. And those of you who are so music mindful, and I see some of my dear music friends uh, in the background, we can just hear um, these words being sung also. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. At verse four, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Whatever those gates may be, whatever those courts may be, we know that we are to enter them and therefore care for them with a spirit of God-glorifying gratitude and praise, knowing that God has brought them to life and equipped them to us, that we may bless the Lord's name and bring about goodness and declare steadfast love and faithfulness, not just for ourselves, but giving thanks that we are the living legacy of these uh, facilities and grounds, uh, preparing them also as best we can for all generations. Thank you. So ultimately, this talk of, of uh, loving facilities and grounds and seeing them as best we can as, as blessing and not burden, and um, it's an act of stewardship. And we know a steward is a person who manages matters of a household for an owner. Um, it's a position of trust and responsibility. In many ways, it's a position of privilege that, that someone has, has given unto us something that we can care for. We're, we're stewards of our, our bodies as temples of the Lord. We're stewards of each other as friends in Christ and members of the human family and the church. And we are each, therefore, a steward of God, and therein God's grace and goodness. And when we look at buildings, and we look at grounds, and we look at the, the, all the possessions and properties we have, when we see them first through a lens of grace and goodness, therein lies their potential to be something that is, is blessing. Um, oh, they, they have all their challenges, and we'll talk about that, and they have all their um, issues and and points of fret and worry and oh my goodness how to pay for and what to do with but that's seen through the lens of being a good steward and seen through the the wanting to to be grace even as god is gracious unto us to to want them to be full of some measure good measure of goodness even as we are are those who receive overflowing and infinite and eternal goodness from god through uh, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through the indwelling power and equipping and comforting of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. So, oh, 39 books in the old, 27 in the new, 66 together. They speak so much about so many amazing, wonderful things. Of course they do. It's the word of God for the people of God. And they'll, they'll tell about how to, to look after each other how to look after what is given unto us, and, and how to, again, keep it ready and able for, for others to use um, some we may know not as, as community outreach and, and mission orientation. Uh, some may be just little people who will grow to be adults, and, and we know that we want to, to leave the church as best we can, even as others have left it for us as best they could I've just picked two, what I hope you will find, I know you will find wonderful passages of God's word that speak to facilities and grounds and, and who we are and, and how we can be when we look at what God has entrusted to us. Here we have from 1 Corinthians 3, for we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? To which we respond, yes, humbly and faithfully, we, we do know that. 
And we want to use our skill and our time and our togetherness uh, to, to build upon that. And I, I love that portion there at the end of 10, each person must choose with care. Ah, the Bible is so beautiful, God's word. It could have just said each builder must choose how to build on it, but God is God. And the, ah, each builder must choose with care. You being here, you being a part of this expresses your care, your wanting to, to figure out how to best to look after your boiler and uh, fix that sidewalk or wonder, in fact, in truth, if the building must be changed or, or moved along. And Karen spoke about things to that end. But as so long as they are with us, we will be with care for them. And we will be with care even as we think of what is best next to do with them. From 1 Peter 4 at 10, ah, each as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's good, as good stewards of God's varied grace, varied grace, uh, amazing grace pours upon us in so many ways. And we say today pours upon us as facility and grounds to equip the saints for holy living, to be shelter in the storms, to welcome neighbor and community and things like that. Thanks be to God for these readings from his own most holy word. So here's a picture of a yeah, church. And so today we're going to be talking about caring for church buildings and facilities and grounds. Um, and uh, of course, that's a component of both stewardship and evangelism, a missional resource integral to successfully serving your congregation and your outreach to the community. And, you know, one thing, Kirk, you said that to add here is something we really want to do. Do you know why you wanted to add that? Oh, yes, in the spirit of this, this is part of being who we are. Uh, we, we know that, and yet it's good to be reminded of it. So when you get ready to go to one of these uh, facilities and grounds meetings, property management meetings, board of managers meetings, finance and stewardship meetings, um, it, it's, it's a wanting to do this. It's a desire. Um, and yet humbly and respectfully it's acknowledged that there are big issues and big questions but above it all we we have these buildings and grounds for good reason so I, I hope there's a bit of a skip in your step and a smile in your face even as you face uh, the challenges of a building it's a component of our stewardship and our evangelism we'll talk later that um, the house of the lord is a house of goodness a house of grace a proclamation to tell the people so it's in that spirit of, well, yes, I do want to go to this meeting because I am looking after something very important, uh, and therefore it's missional. The, it's, it's a form of service. Uh, it's an outreach, and it's, it's in that whole spirit that I, over the years, with many of you who are on the screen, have uh, been a person who likes fixing roofs, likes talking about um, heating systems, likes making sure the, the lines are painted in the, the parking lot. There are other things that many of you upon this screen know of uh, in me are, are, are not those points of, of, uh, of interest and uh, capacity for me. That's why we're the church, many members, one body. So um, this day is about celebrating this aspect of our shared ministry, our stewardship and evangelism and missions orientations. Uh, but in celebrating this aspect, we celebrate everything that all of us together, wow, can do and be for Jesus. So this is important. So is all the other good stuff. Yeah, so I, I thank you very much, Kirk. I, I should mention, of course, I'm Jim McDonald. I'm uh, the development manager for stewardship and plan giving with the PCC. And I'll be uh, interviewing Kirk today during this, this webinar. And I think Kirk pretty much have a on, handle on everything. But whenever you want, I'll, I'll come in. Um, I we should say that during this webinar, um, Reverend Summers will guide us through the, a robust theology and the practical management of buildings and facilities, staff and volunteers and ministry. So let's begin by talking about the theology of the theology of buildings, facilities and grounds. Kirk? Yeah, thank you. So I do want to give an uh, internet shout out 
to a man that I don't know, but I decided to, to say thanks, Chuck, because his writings and his works, uh, they, they capture a sense of, of sanctuary, a sense of worth and purpose for church building. We're going to, I'm just going to quickly read, this is the only couple of slides that go in this way, but I, I hope they speak to you as, as you celebrate what you have been entrusted in congregations, at camps, and mission agencies, uh, the buildings and grounds that are yours. I hope this leads to some sense of, of affirmation of what you've got and how you can use it and why you have it. Um, I also hope that, that there is in this telling of my words combined with my friend Chuck, who I don't know, that you realize all the resources that are out there um, including me to the extent that I could ever be, knowing that I could call you. I look at this screen, I see these names and faces, and I have no idea where I would be without you. You know who you are, all of you, and um, we are a shared body in that regard. We need each other. So as we celebrate the work of Chuck here, um, we again celebrate each other and know that there are resources to help us get, oh, through the hills and valleys and in-betweens of looking after uh, facilities and grounds. So some words, there's three little slides here, but church facilities and grounds are places of proclamation. They show and tell of God. They're special set-apart places, holy places where the human meets the divine. They can convey permanence and stability, serenity, security, sanctuary. They can be places of peace, of pilgrimage, of purpose. They can transmit something of the character of the faith we hold as people of hope and love for God and neighbor as self. I love building designs and how people make sure they, they say to the world, um, we've got something good to share. They can foster a sense of awe and wonder, holy, 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 of reverence, of respect for the magnificence of of God, uh, those high ceilings, those big blue lamb beams, those uh, uh, pointed ceilings, uh, stained glass, the resounding sound of the organ, the sloped floor, whatever a congregation felt in time, uh, an open space, a gym with a stage, without a stage, with a movable stage, all of it was to, to proclaim uh, reverently, respectfully, the magnificence of God in that time and place with that circumstance. Many of you will know I spent amazing number of good times at Camp Canowan on the shores of Sylvan Lake. And, and we have round here, of course, Karen Camps and, and joining us today, Camp Kintail. Wow, awe and wonder, reverence and respect. Go to, go to Canowan, go to Kintail, go to Cairn, go to camps all across this province, all across this country. So the, the place itself is of interest and note. The reason behind it is of wonder and, and what it's able to do. Thanks back to Chuck. They can bring about feelings of curiosity and a strengthening of interest in the way and will of God. Here at Bayview in the 401, just about right underneath the 401 highway, people simply pull off the highway to come in for a moment's time in the sanctuary. Maybe they've driven all the way from Montreal and they're heading all the, the way to uh, Manitoba and they just want to stop. And they pull off the 401 and we know not how the spirit moves, but it's sure nice when we know that the church is there at uh, times like that. They can be places where the stories of people's lives and local communities and a shared concern for others can be connected to the story of God's engagement with humanity through Jesus Christ. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. The sheer presence of a church's facilities and grounds can remind us that God took form and presence in Jesus. Jesus, yet without sin, knows who we are and how we are. They could tell of creation, of incarnation, and of resurrection. They are there to be proclaimers. They can have such an important and impactful part to play in serving the common good, being the house of God as a host of good. They remind us that God chooses to be revealed sometimes in specific places. Just noting the Old Testament here, but times when, when God you know, took a spot, made a spot special, we commission buildings, we bless them, we care for them in that same similar spirit, if you will, of Jacob in Genesis and Moses in Exodus and Isaiah in Isaiah, they do witness to our faith 
Christ being alive, for he has risen indeed. We are those of empty cross. We are those of empty tomb. We are a resurrected powered people. And it's great when our church uh, lives and moves and has its being in that same spirit. They help a local congregation as the body men of Christ to be together for worship, to be taught, fed, set out to love and serve in the world. We'll speak of that sort of later on in a sort of quadrilateral kind of way, but um, the capacity of, of, uh, of a church a building and its grounds is is amazing. The grounds especially can provide a space also where creation is able to flourish. Uh, we had people in here today. I didn't know they were coming, but they came to look after the gardens and were a bit particular about that, my personality perhaps, but they, a haven for wildlife, a place for beautiful flora and fauna to grow, and that's not always the case. But I went on a congregational hike yesterday out to Scarborough, near the Scarborough Bluffs, and there's this bridge over which the train goes, and it shakes and carries on. And you look up underneath, there are probably a hundred barn swallow nests. So it's remarkable where you can plant a flower and uh, look after a bird. There we go. So those are thoughts from Charles Chadwick about uh, church buildings and their beauty and their worth. There's a link in the information there about how to continue to be in touch with him and, and read some of his work just at the bottom there. Thanks, Jim. So here, the next slide, it's, uh, we all know before you're inside, you're outside, you've got to get in there. That's why I just love the phrase uh, facilities and grounds. It, it's a love that sort of came uh, in phrasing over the years. There's different ways to say the same thing, but before you're inside a church, you're outside it. So don't forget the grounds. Uh, and that's a whole discussion, of course, about signage and, and lighting and no slip and falls and things like that. It's accessibility. Oh, that's uh, so important. If you, if you yourself or someone in your care who you love so very much has um, mobility issues, um, uh, site issues. It's just, it doesn't take too long to, to think, oh, how, how can we ask them what is best for them? How can we make this work? And when I go into an old church or an old church camp and I see a big ramp that someone's made go all the way up from the beach or an elevator, they somehow fit in to go up to the balcony and down to the basement. I just smile. I'm so happy. Uh, it's so, um, so nice to see. Saying that, time for a little story. A dear friend in Calgary, I mentioned to him, how was it when you were younger? He's older than I am. How this accessibility thing? And he just looked at me with a smile and said, there were four young men assigned every Sunday to lift the chairs up the big stairs. Don't you think that we didn't forget how to make those folks comfortable and get them to church. So um, throughout the history of God's people and their buildings, we've been finding a way to make sure people get to worship, get to meetings, get to fellowship, things like that. The parking, that's just a tough one. We used to be able to park on Sunday wherever you want. Now you can't, or there's lots of different signs and uh, churches that are so much a part of my salvation history of my spiritual journey are those churches that now are are pickled for parking um they'll find a new a new way and but parking is is important and and that's almost doesn't need to be said uh, gardens trees and such uh, oh i have three chainsaws and i like sort of nothing better than chopping down a tree if you have a dead one near you or on your grounds and i'm within driving distance i'd love to come and, and work away at it uh, the point being made, it's not so good to have a lot of those things not in the best of shape. And again, the resources that, that are there, we first of all, pray our way uh, in these challenges about how do we get the tree down or how can we get the garden, but, but to aim high and hope that there's a way of, of, uh, of making those things as you would want them to be. And just that old, it's from a deodorant commercial, actually, that I first entered this phrase. So, but never get a second chance to make a first impression. They were encouraging men to use their deodorant. But the whole spirit of it is, you know, people take a peek uh, at our websites. They take a peek at our buildings and grounds. And uh, just to be mindful that, that that first impression is not just of, of 
of you and your church, but it's, it's an impression of the faith. It's an impression of how these folks think about God and God's presence in life. So just mindful of that. And I apologize if the deodorant uh, commercial was out of place. So I like, I like exclamation marks. And, uh, um, and I love Acts chapter two. And uh, my dear, dear Westminster Calgary and its uh, founding charter and its initial declaration of purpose uh, way back there. Um, a short 30, uh, five, six years ago, it had Acts chapter two. So this is uh, affection of my fondness for Westminster, uh, my fondness for the church. And uh, first and foremost, the gospel of good news is ours to proclaim. It's, it's to tell others because we, in word and deed, because we, we can remember the first time it, it clicked for us that the light that God was shining on us, we let shine. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers, they were together. They had common affection. They had common bond. They had, oh, they were all different, thank goodness. But they each had wonderful things uh, to do for the wonderful thing they had in common, devoting themselves to teaching, fellowship, word, sacrament, neighborly affection and care. So all of those things being said, yay, the church. Yay, the church. But and ooh, we're also facility operators and groundskeepers to the glorious end above. That's why we do all this. I have all the energy in the world to shovel snow. And uh, I see my dear friend, Jack Shepard on the screen. And he and I used to park halfway uh, to Medicine Hat and a shout out to, to Medicine Hat. Um, Jeff, good to see you. The, we, we, uh, Jack and I would always park at Tom Bain Secondary School so we could leave lots of parking at the church for people. And we'd trudge up there and shovel snow together. And if you've ever been to extreme Northwest Calgary, there's a lot of snow when it decides to come. I don't ever recall thinking it wasn't a fair bit of fun, Jack uh, and others. Um, yay, the church. And may that attitude of, of resurrection, of this is good, uh, permeate uh, all of that. Well, that's a segue. Oh, Canada. It's cold outside, especially in Northwest Calgary, down in Medicine Hat. It's cold outside, and it's uh, 2023. Two thoughts in the same title. Uh, a defense for church home, not meant to be that way, just to acknowledge that Canada has four seasons. It's tough. Um, our roof has a life and a mind of its own here at Trinity York Mills. Uh, so... It's, it's important. It's, it's cold. Churches need to have a place to flourish, to live their life, wherever that place is. A full celebration of, of malls and, and yurts and, and apartment buildings and home churches and cluster churches and everything, everywhere, however it may look. The people to be together and, and to, to value however that home church or that that camp or that mission agency or that historic cornerstone church or that new suburban context or all the other aspects of ministry, but just to know that that space is special, that the, the togetherness is special. Uh, just on to 2023, we've had to, oh my, when I came here, wasn't that long ago, about nine years, we, you know, there was still need to make uh, internet throughout the whole building. And now we're into security and all those things. So it changes over time since there was um, in, back there with Moses and Isaiah, um, things have changed, but the spirit of it all, I'm sure they are, their sacred spaces uh, were very mindful. And, and to talk about these things and to not apologize for why you need to do them and to see them again as a blessing unfolding instead of a burden uh, upon you. Integrity of operations, Alan P.F. Sell, uh, aspects of Christian integrity. I had the privilege to worship with him and learn with him and be supervised by him. And ever since my encounters with him and integrity has mattered so much, he, he now rests eternal with God. But I, my understanding of integrity because of Alan Sell is, I hope, uh, God glorifying. 
So the operations need integrity. We'll talk a little long, later on about truth and transparency and, and those types of things, but ground everything in the good news as resurrected power, uh, powered people. Um, just to do what you do really well. Uh, you know, don't promise what you can't deliver and, and look after things. So very briefly, and, and Jim, thank you for taking these thoughts I've had for years and putting them there and, and all the people over the years that I've borrowed from and uh, my life is a copyright of uh, everyone uh, from my family to my friends, to congregations, to uh, my life is just a, a wonderful gathering of so many other people's wonderful thoughts uh, above well, all I, the word of God. Well, you, I was your uh, student uh, during my practicum at Knox College. I graduated with my MDiv as a mature student last year, very mature. Um, and as my practicum leader, I, when you were teaching me about this quadrant, I, it's, a visual, uh, it's a visualization that can be very effective, a quadrant. I remember them from, my, I have many years of experience in business. And so I'm, I remember them being used to, to talk about things like optimizing workforce and process and assets and customer experience and that sort of thing. Uh, but can you explain this quadrant to us? Because it's specific to the church. Yeah. It's the first of several that that we'll look at briefly today. So just to know what your purpose is. And from your purpose comes your programming, from your programming comes the people that you need and, and can have and are available as they're called and able to, to help do the programming to fulfill the purpose. And then the plant as in the space, uh, the facilities, the grounds, the, the literally the campground or that you can do it. The, the challenge here of course is oh my goodness, we have a big gym, we should have a youth group. That's kind of putting your programming or your plant rather uh, before your purpose. Did you, did you really want a youth group? Are you able to do it? Would it be better to do it with someone else? So it's, it's uh, tricky at times because your plant can get ahead of your programming, your people can get ahead of your purpose and all those sorts of things. But that's why worship is, is wonderful where we gather weekly to, to know whose we are, uh, therefore who we are and what we can do. And I just encourage you to, to, to think of things in terms of your purpose, your program, your people, your plant, and uh, do your programming and your, your people, your human resources, uh, volunteers, staffing, are they positioned for success? Do they have clarity in their terms of reference? And and uh, in time allocations to do their programming to fulfill their purpose. It seems so simple, but if you start at the wrong spot, it gets a, uh, it's just a little tougher. And it's great. We have the confessional statements of the church. We have all those different uh, ways that we, we say that we love Jesus. And then from that, how are we going to program the church? How are we going to ask the people, invite them, encourage them to participate. And where do we need to do that? Maybe it's a, a bus. Maybe it's a boat. Maybe it's a good old downtown church. Maybe it's one way, way, way up uh, beyond caribou country. Um, but what is the purpose? And we know it's uh, take it from a Westminster confession, take it from living faith, a uh, chief end, glorify God, enjoy God forever, be uh, together the church is jesus christ together with his people call both to worship and serve him all life how are we going to do that who's going to do that where are we going to do that so just the sense of purpose and program i've mentioned those things another little quadrilateral quadrant i get those mixed up four things on one page what is needed to achieve the purpose well theories abound good ones absolutely but it, over the years again being having the massive privilege of helping to begin a a brand new church from people's homes to a school for 128 sundays onto one building two buildings all those things you had to keep kind of there weren't assumptions you, you couldn't be sure that everybody knew exactly where we were going and what we were doing less of all the minister so Purpose. Well, there's worship, there's study, there's fellowship, and there's service. And then there's number five. You wrap all of that in the stewardship of all of life. So very briefly, where can that purpose and program be fulfilled? By whom? Purpose, program, people, and plant. So 
the the one is the chief act of the people of God is to glorify, worship, and enjoy God forever. So will the space allow you to do that? Many different theories. Again, after the Second World War, they built sort of cookie cutter churches. All I, I have one here. It's stuck out the back end of the this church where it just there's a church up, worship up top, education, then a f- jammed it all into one building. Beautiful. Other places, a gym. Beautiful. But c- is it positioned to have worship, study, fellowship, togetherness, and in, in, including the aspects of pastoral care and prayer as one? And then the service where we're here for us and we're here for others. It does it equip people to, to, to reach out and, and serve. Uh, that could be uh, on site or from site. These m- beautiful commercial kitchens across our country that turn out food for out of the cold and, and evangel hall and things like that. Um, just, just that the building will be mindful of all the different ways. So quick story. Here, 2737 Bayview Avenue, 1960, they built a huge room. They didn't really know what quite to do because everything was happening. So it's a huge room with stained glass windows, basketball hoops, markings on the floor for badminton, a stage, and a big, beautiful wooden roof and six entry doors. It's just used for everything all the time, uh, just mindful of what each space can do relative to the purpose of a congregation. And I just accent again, the stewardship of time, of talent, of energy, of resources, of prayer, wrapped around the purpose of a church. Yeah, buildings, they- How do facilities and grounds contribute to the sense of identity and belonging and mission? Well, go go to websites and see how or annual reports or when someone speaks about the history of a church they most often say the land was gifted to the congregation by a sibling church and then we built our first phase our second phase then we brought in accessibility and then we put in a four level parking lot or something like that so the identity is wrapped up so much we court we know of course within it there's all those other things but it's a place of belonging too. One of my greatest joys is when someone gets off the airplane and just wants to come to the church, uh, or brings friends from a uh, friends have come in from another country. They want to show them their church and make sure they're there on Sunday to worship God together. Churches are very much a part of our identity, our spirit of belonging, and our mission too. tell a story that's a basketball hoop one of many basketball rather one of many things the church encourages the people of god to do the things the people of god need to do and be the church is in a point of encouragement and uh i i hope it can be that for you i hope that um you you enjoy the the life of your church i respect so much the challenge of looking after a building and wondering if it's too big um church i'm at here it's too big for the congregation. It basically always has been. So we've had to do other things with it. Uh, we have African church, uh, Arabic church, an Indonesian church. We have a, a large Alcoholics Anonymous group. We have bands and all different things. I don't know if that's what the folks who originally built it thought that it would be used for, but just encourages us to do the things that people of God need to do and be and, and helping community, uh, reaching out to neighbor, um, we're not the only ones who can dribble the basketball in that way. So let's move on to part two of our webinar, uh, in which we apply the theory and theology you've been discussing, Kirk, uh, to the practical management of facilities and grounds. Well, again, don't know if I know anything about the practical management of facility grounds, but didn't grow up in the household that I grew up in and Thanks to mom and dad and my brother. I um, So I, I'd love to break into song, think I'll go out to Alberta. I won't go on any longer, but uh, that's Westminster, Calgary. In uh, 1991, uh, March 31st, 1991, we opened the first portion. That's just the one peak on your left. And then um, in August 25th of 95, we opened the whole thing. It has a nice slope floor. It's, uh, I can tell you just about where every screw is in that building and every piece of wood and uh, impacted my uh, 
my existence and my identity and my belonging. And I, I don't have the words to express my gratitude to the people of R.C. Acres Church and Westminster Church and the Presbytery of Calgary McLeod and the National Church, uh, Ian Morrison, um, Ralph Kendall, Presbyterian Church Building Corporation, um, Canada Ministries, uh, purchased the land, uh, helped pay me. Uh, it was great. I was uh, started as an associate at Varsity Acres, time of our lives for Nancy and then Alex and Jamie were born in Alberta. So I just wanted to say that uh, my love for church buildings and church grounds and church heating and venting and air conditioning systems and church trees comes so much from these good people. And I will never forget them. And I will love them always. A place to love for a people who are loving and who want to love church. So those of you who know me and may remember the Reverend Dr. Jerry Graham got an honorary doctorate from Knox College. He didn't ever wrote a book or did anything like this in his life. He was just such a phenomenally good man who we loved so much. I had the privilege to study under him in 1986. And I can only hope that these little stories inspire you to think about the people who have helped you love Jesus and love the churches, the facilities and grounds that help you be for him and your friends and help the world know of his love. So that's an 83 Tercel. It's the same color, $1,500, four cylinder, 83 horsepower, front wheel drive. I could go anywhere in Alberta, no matter the snowstorm. So four cylinders. For a congregation to be humming, uh, so to speak, um, it can hum in different ways, but just as this story unfolds, it, to help a, a building um, hum well, you want to, to the people in primary leadership. It could be minister, it certainly minister is significant, and I wanted to acknowledge that. And it's, it's pretty healthy when a minister has a healthy attitude towards the building, its operations, its finances, its stuff like that. So the health of the, the minister and it's th their interest in the building is a good thing. Uh, the congregation and how it's structured, uh, you probably want a facilities and grounds committee or a board of managers. And of course they're there and are they, are they healthy? And is there any way that you can pray for them more or seek out more resources? So these things help your 83 Tercel uh, run on its four cylinders, the staffing, the human resources that you may be able to hire um, to help with any aspect of, of church life, but certainly in this particular context that can help you with your building. Um, I would include in staffing, I do include in staffing, what we call excellent service providers. So we have on call at the ready HVAC people, snow removal people, lighting people, carpet people, they care for us, we care for them. Um, and then all of those things help the congregation to, to run its facilities and grounds. And those things together create an identity. And it's, it's nice. So if you're ever asked to go in and assess a congregation or a camp or a mission ministry of some degree and measure, you know, who's, who's in charge and how goes that? Um, how, how are the people? How are the people who support the people and how is the place uh, that does not operate independently of the minister and the congregants, however they may be, and the support that wraps around them. It's not an independent entity out there by itself. I had to drive that car. I had to make sure it was filled with gas. I had to take it to the mechanic. Seems so simple, but so, so important. Sometimes people approach facilities and grounds um, in ways that don't position them or the facilities and grounds for success. So good to have those in leadership concerned about those things, the congregation as a whole, and uh, the people that support it. I wanted to put this in because of, uh, you know, we're, it, it's just so, it's, it's in commerce and industry and manufacturing and production, it's in education and healthcare, safety first, and it's, it's in the church. Certainly we have leading with care, uh, the important documents, our incident reports, if there is a slip and fall, if someone sees a light that's out or, you know, that's really, really important, the, vigilant, the vigilance around safety and security. Just 
obstacles to avoid and correct in facility design, just that will position people to fulfill the proclamation. If uh, people can't see the screen, if people can't get in a locked door, uh, we have nine doors that could be open on a Sunday to our church here, and they keep us hopping as to which one is right and who's coming in and out. Um, I speak a bit about reserve funding. Uh, you know, I'm always interested when, you know, big, huge churches have been built or big things have put, been put in place without the money set aside to care for them. And if you can get some reserve funding in place, it's hard to do because there's always money wanted for other things. But it's just like at a condominium. If you can tuck away a bit of money, uh, we take 10% of all our rental money and tuck it aside for that leak that comes um, that's a bit of a misuse of that wonderful song, but it only takes a spark to get a fire burning. burning. So um, in my nine years here, we've had seven full dumpsters. I think those that know me know that I just love to throw things out that are in the way. And can you believe it? In seven years, including during COVID, we generated, uh, in nine years, we've generated seven dumpsters. Don't be shy. Um, and a lawyer can cost a lot more than a repair. Yeah. Just, no, I love this graphic. <laughs> so how, how should churches evaluate and adapt their physical space yeah. during changing well, times, Kurt? Yes. Well, if you know about the Gestetner, uh, my, my dear mama, deaconess of the Presbyterian Church, had a special cloak, if you will, to, to work the Gestetner, because that, that person operating that Gestetner will not go home looking that good. If you've ever worked with a Gestetner, all the ink will be all over her and she'll have to change her shoes. Um, it was the uh, original photocopier, if you will. I remember landing at Westminster Calgary and someone phoning me up and asking me if I wanted one of these. And I respectfully said no. And they said, well, well then I'll phone Heritage Village. And I thought, my goodness, I might have some trouble getting this church uh, into it, but I didn't uh, with the people. But it's hard to, 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 to ke keep up to all the changes. Uh, Gestetners aren't used much in churches anymore, and my mom's Gestetner cloak is now tucked away. Um, it, of course, it won't fit in the cloud. We, our archivist here has everything that ever happened in this church on the cloud. It's remarkable. It's important that church value its space in light of its purpose for volunteers, minister, and staff. The original design, the original stuff might not be the best design today. It's okay uh, don't quote me at the meeting that gets you in trouble by any means, but it's okay to move a wall. It's, it's okay uh, to say that space was once for that, um, but we'd like to talk about its decommissioning, its re-identification, how it's going to be. If your Gestetner won't fit in your cloud, um, prayerfully wonder how and why you might still have a Gestetner and do you put, need to put something on the cloud? Yeah. So, so, Kirk, how would you leverage the church building to diversify the church's income? Yeah. So that leverage, uh, Jim, is, is paramount where I am now. We're 27,000 square feet located. If you had a good arm, any member of the Blue Jays could put a baseball on the 401 from my office. Uh, we need to rent. That's the discernment of the congregation through the leadership of the session. Um, so we need to leverage it to, to be the church we're called to be. So it's either with a frown that we go, oh man, this church is so big. What are we going to do with it? Or it's with a smile that we say, wow, thanks for the building. Do you realize that we can make $250,000, $300,000 a year, $26,000, $4,000, whatever the number may be, to help power the congregation. That's the key. Just speaking to the title. I've built five outhouses. I don't know how that became my destiny. Um, but I only ever got built one, <laughs> two for ourselves. But just there's joy. There's joy in sharing your loo and your pew, your chairs, your pianos, your carpets, your kitchens. Uh, it's that attitudinal shift back to the purpose back to Jesus, back to why the church is, who the church is, uh, back to Acts 2, back to the greatest commandments. It's great when a congregation is camp, whatever, eager to share, but it needs to be in the context, I believe, that it doesn't hurt the ministry 
or hurt the proclamation. Another commercial, fourth one from long ago. It's that ego you put Wait, in. The I'm, I'm just going to go back one slide. I skipped the mm -hmm. slide. Sorry, Kirk. Did I or didn't I? Um, yeah, I thought I did. Hold on. Nope, it's this one. Sorry, my apologies. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's just, you know, that little guy, let go of your ego. But um, to rent a program, to rent a church, to have it utilized at large, to welcome the neighborhood in, and uh, the... I just, yeah, to enhance the programming, to, to give a generous spirit, uh, it's obvious. It can increase church revenue, and proceeds can be used for lots of good reasons, uh, to help with labor, to help with operations, to help with debt retirement, to increase reserve funding, to help further protect the investment, to strengthen the identity, and, and to be about the mission spirit that the building uh, can can bring uh, so to be able to articulate this that that rentals and space use for beyond self it's not best for every context and that's respected um, and uh, I don't believe when this church was built it, it, the people ever thought that it would be used as it is used today but it is um, a happy survival technique at this present time not everyone can do it by any means um, but it does help us do our ministry and fulfill our mission. Yeah. Kurt, there's a question. Oh, please. That came in. Um, someone's asking about what happens when a congregation is coming to the end of their life together after almost 200 years? How do we honor the space that nurtured them? Any thoughts? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, my thoughts are that even in a, as a church is moving to decommissioning, even as a church is moving to be sold or used in other ways, that God is still being glorified. So the, I know that that's not uh, in the practical management answer category. So, but that's the initial thought that um, there is a season and things come to a close in due course. The, the joy of it all is to give thanks for what has happened and what can happen with the resources that would be attained, either for oneself or for another context. Even more specifically in terms of practical management is to reach out to other ministries and agencies of neighborly love that can use, use the resources. Um, I've moved several times uh, from places where I planted beautiful trees and I've always seen that I was just a steward of them for a time and they go on. And it's that mindset of, again, uh, final response initially is, is what was the purpose of it all from the beginning? It was to give God the glory in the service of the risen Christ, fill the world with his love. And um, if the, the building after 200 amazing years can still be used, even in its decommissioning, even in its closure, even in its multi-use capacities to glorify God, to serve Christ, to fill the world with his love, then, it, then that's, that's why it existed in the first place. So my answer. Um, just to please pay. Uh, we used to give it to Elections Canada for free. Uh, they've got lots of money. It's your money and our money and my money, but, but do, uh, do uh, um, think about fair rental value. Um, and does it fit with your charter? Be careful with the CRA charter. Don't, don't in any way whatsoever violate it or stretch it. We, everything is done with why the congregation was, it came into existence and is in accordance with the Canadian Revenue Agency. Um, but if, if you want, we'll talk in a moment about benevolence, use of the building, but if someone can pay and it's within your charter and with totally legal and ethical and right up front, and, and tracked and recorded accordingly. Um, I it's please, hey, the movie industry around here, my goodness, they they rent this for our parking lot, they rent our buildings, they rent our bathrooms, they rent our kitchens, and they have a little bit of money, and some of their money comes to us. Um, it's this is an important thing is uh, you know the facility renters power the church, uh, not the other way around, and. Uh, enables the church also as we'll talk in a moment to be uh, to be about its benevolence there we go yeah missional neighborly love 
benevolent users. Uh, that helps the church fulfill its purpose. So we have people who pay lots of money to us here, and that allows us to have lots of people that don't pay money be here also. And uh, But that takes good meetings. It takes good prayer. It takes uh, an alertness to not violate any laws or anything like that. It takes insurance certificates and uh, supervision and all those sorts of things. It takes damage deposits so that if something happens, you... But all that stuff comes from how could the space be used to give God the glory um, for those that can pay great, for those that can't, uh, those that pay can help us look after them. Yeah, just there at the bottom, how much space can we give away and when? Um, it's always a challenge. Everyone wants prime time. And then estimate the value. And that's that's been a real challenge here in Toronto where rents have just increased um, and uh but, but we have a real estate person. We have uh, uh, building brokers that, that help us know how to maximize our paid rental uh, so that more benevolent uses can be realized. Yeah. I, I was moved several years ago by the movie, The Help, and it's respectfully that I put this title here. Um, the complexity of some of our buildings, the time it takes to look after them, it's sometimes tough to leave it in the hands of volunteers. And I realize it's such a fine line and every context is different, but there may be a need for vigilance and expertise to be hired, um, to take money, to make money or to spend money to look after and, and just the encouragement um, that if that should be considered, there are good people, good service providers. Again, Trinity York Mills, thousands of square feet of space lots of potential, lots of issues. We need help to, to care for our building. Yeah. So, so what factors in, in staffing church facilities and grounds, what factors should be considered when assessing whether to merge part-time jobs, whether to hire a church manager, uh, that sort of staffing? Yeah. Well, so this is, this is a, a personal opinion from a personal context. I'll get in and out of it promptly. But again, saying right at the front, respecting your context completely. We needed to consider a church manager. So a lot of ministers historically, when they would go to a church, they would say, I need help with Christian education. I need help with pastoral care. Absolutely no diminishment of those positions at all we need a church manager in order that our building could be maximized. And that's a distinctive position held by a good, faithful, qualified person who manages the property in security, in information technology, in rental acquisitions, in care. So there, and that has been really freeing for this congregation and fruitful. Also, we were the merging of part-time jobs, not wishing to take a job away from anyone, not wishing to criticize an ounce of what someone may do or a present context, it would never do that. But we were able to merge some part-time jobs and turn them into salaried positions so that people were on site more and had a greater awareness and ownership of processes. And then realizing that everyone had a gift and had an opportunity. So some custodians want to clean and that some don't. Some cleaners want to be custodial and some don't. Some administrative assistants want to shovel snow and some don't. Some different things. It's, it's analyzing and respecting and evaluating to get the maximum benefit from the employee skill set and the needs of the people, who they are, and a complete assessment and an interest inventory. You can have a fantastic person on site that just, for whatever reason, their interests or their abilities can't do particular things to celebrate who they are and where they're at and to, to be about looking um, at other, other um, ways of, of doing things. And one of the ways that changed our life here was I was hiring a church uh, manager. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about the key attributes and qualifications that you look for when hiring staff and yeah. how, how you do that. So acknowledging that not every congregation has staff or can have staff and that some have lots of staff. So these are my little 
HR recipes and ingredients, and they've served me well in the context that I've been in over time. Um, I didn't have them when I started at all, picked them up along the way, picked up a lot of them outside the church. Just, just I want you to have this slide if it's helpful to you. Um, we ask of the people that work here to provide support, service, and solutions. We, we, that's how it rolls here, those three S's. So what's the difference? You can imagine uh, support and service and solutions. To support is, is to actually help someone do the work, uh, to service someone, uh, to, you know, to, to come in, to, to provide an actual, actual service. So to support someone doing it, to provide the service for it, and to be about solutions. So much of life is about solving a problem, facing a challenge, climbing a mountain, and, and to create a mindset where we're trying to solve the problem, that everyone's on it together. Um, and certainly those who may work at the church, that they would provide those three S's. And that's how we evaluate each other. That's how we look for uh, people to recruit. And that's how we discern their retention and things like that. The big circle on the right, do you want it? Can you do it? Do you fit? That's how I look at myself in the context in which I have found myself in the church and out of the church and in all of life. Do I actually want to do this? Can I do this? Do I fit? Do I belong here? And when you get people who have an affection for the building, volunteers and staff who, who want to do it, who, who can do it, or and part of can do it is realizing you don't and getting the help to do it. And, and do you fit? Is this something you have the time to do? Is this something you, you want to do? And it's been really helpful to me in relationship to the staff who have been in my care I also want it to really share quite loudly. It's been enormous for me to look at myself. Am I supporting people? Am I being of service to people? Am I providing solutions or at least trying to? And do I want to? Can I do it? And do I fit? And then when you look at the building, do you have the right people, including yourself, in the right places doing the right thing to help the building be all that it can be? That's my little basic HR yeah. yeah, that would have made a very good Venn diagram, I just realized, because you could have oh, wow. all three cross each other, and wherever you're in the middle, that's where you should be in the church, of course. Yeah, and again, all of this can have points of celebration. There are people who are amazing at support, amazing at solutions, and to, to celebrate the many members one body, but to make sure that, that your building is seen in, in through the light of of the building is cared for in a manner that it's providing support, service, and solutions, will you will, but that the people who are caring for it, care for it in light of these things. Yeah. <laughs> so, at 1980, I graduate from grade 13, East Church Secondary School in Barrie, and I go off to take a sociology degree at Wilfrid Laurier. And people say, Kirk, why are you doing that at Wilfrid Laurier? With two eyes, actually, no E in Wilfrid. Um, well, because I knew in my heart that I was being called to be a minister. I only shared that with Nancy along the way. And sociology was great for me. For others, it was chemical engineering. I, but it was good for me. And one definition of sociology is it's the science of the obvious. You, just It's obvious. You don't have a seatbelt on. You might have a little more trouble in a collision in terms of injuries. So but sometimes the obvious isn't so obvious. Uh, I just, if it ain't fixed, it's broke. And uh, it's okay to name it. It's okay to say we have a problem here. We have to fix this. Um, the church in the city where I live has one of those massive stained glass windows, and they're trying to work away with it, uh, just to name it. And, and to name it confidently and clearly. You are simply trying to look after the church to proclaim the good news of Jesus and giving God the glory, equipping the saints for holy living, loving neighbor. It's, it's not wrong. It's, it's, not, uh, it's what has to be done. The, the, the worship, the people together, the great act of the people of God uh, to, to help the church be that. And the things that don't help the church and need to be fixed, encouragement to, to fix them, to reach out to other churches who may be able to help, to pray, pray. How can we do this so we're ready for Sunday? Um, 
cannot assume a poor building will suffice any more than a poor 83 Tercel would suffice. It's, it's okay to name it and it's hard, but it, it, to, the fire systems, the, the toilets, uh, the things uh, to do an audit, to do an inventory, to have a walkabout. Um, we had to pay $10,600. I just, ugh, for a building commission assessment to have everything in this church assessed for safety, security, and to put a care plan in place for it. It had reached that point in its history, but you can do your own building condition assessment and think, oh, and you may need to get a dumpster or you may need to to close a certain spot for a certain while. Um, the personnel are needed one way or another to care, to maximize potential, to have it ready on a Sunday morning. I, oh, I mentioned Jack earlier, a man by the name of Jock Dempster, people over the years who arrived at the church so early in the morning to set up chairs, to shovel, uh, just for the season of your life where you can do those things to get it ready to, to worship, to get it ready to study, to get it ready to serve, to get it ready to fellowship, to get it positioned so that people want to give as stewards of their time, talent, energy, and resources, and at the very least, a good Sunday worship experience, um, you know, that the, the, the saints are equipped for holy living, that they're together in the Lord, that they are common in that great experience. Um, a positive worship so significantly fosters fellowship, service, stewardship, and the and church. I would I would have to assume, Kirk, that the things that end up in the dumpster are <laughs> the things that are obstacles to worship in the end. Yes, ultimately. Um, here, of course, with our parking lot, people just drop off couches with lots of flowers and cat hair, thinking <laughs> that we might need them. But no, absolutely, Jim. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just, I said this earlier, we wanted to accent this again. Uh, it takes money for all of this to happen. And I know way whatsoever. Um, I spent my entire life um, basically not knowing where, or not, shouldn't say not knowing, but having to make sure the money was coming in the door. And I understand the challenge from private business to, uh, to church life. Um, but the challenge is, is wonderful in that it, the challenge is, to let the world know that it is loved to love by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Son of God. So there are bills to pay, um, and we want to look after the legacy, and it does take money, and to put the strategic plans together for stewardship, to face the challenges so much, the New Testament, so much of the New Testament talks about money and possessions and caring for it and dealing with the tensions that come with it. So to, to have that open conversation, um, but, but beginning with prayer and uh, beneath the cross in front of the empty tomb, that's why we're doing it. It's so much easier to talk about money when you know why you're talking about it. Yeah. Well, money follows mission, right? And yeah. so if, if the church, if the building, the facilities, the, the grounds are all about um, lifting up this one critically important goal, uh, becomes teleological, you are, you know, you can speak to um, money following mission, and it goes to the building because the building is a support for all of that. Yeah, and and it, it goes back to that question also, which is was very nice to receive when a church is coming to a close of its of its timeliness, and it's time to 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 let it go. It, it's it's let go for God's love, knowing it was that's why it was there. And uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard. There are tears and it's hard to watch your communion table go somewhere else or not know what to do with it. Would never diminish those. But, but the decision is made to give God the glory and continue to find a way to help this world know that it is love to love. Yeah. I love this little bit. I'd like to give a shout out to Oak Ridge Presbyterian Church. Hi. Um, in London, Ontario, and uh, Reverend Dr. Terry Ingram and others there who helped me come to a full understanding of, of some of these things. There's five fingers of finance. Um, you can create more. You can put some together as we have on the bottom. But um, I went to Stewards by Design way back years ago with uh, friends from Westminster, Calgary. And uh, 
it was it was amazing for April, Richard, Ken, and myself. We went back to Westminster. We we're so excited. So thank you to those that brought that to life many years ago. Um, was it was tremendous. So not too long on the screen because it just shows what it is. But what this, if you can get all five of these, so some measure of healthiness and happiness. Um, the ties and offerings. Uh, those of you who know me, I very seldom ever separate those two words. The tithing is we've sat down at the beginning of the year and we are giving X percentage, be it of gross or net, to the life, work, and witness of the church. That's what it is for me and my house. And that's what a tithe is. An offering is, ah, well, oh, that's what we'll put in this week. That's good. Um, so I like to keep those two together. The investment portfolio, if you have one, respecting you don't, um, but don't. Um, it's part of, of life and it's part of people's lives too. People have their capital and then they have their investments that generate. And uh, just to look after that, if you have that portfolio and if, if others have it in the life of the church, it's, it's how do you take the money you've got and, and help it work even more for the life of the church. Fundraising, which is, is different than all those other things. It's the one-off special events and there's a whole world of fundraising. If you're trying to raise $500,000, don't begin with a bake sale. Um, you know, sort of begin with trying to find someone who could give maybe a gift, of, a large gift to keep it rolling and start off. But there's, there's uh, ways of doing all of these, of, of creating a pledge at the beginning of the year of, of how the offering is picked up. COVID sure put a twist on that, where the offering plates are, how you speak about it in worship. And the investment, the fundraising, the rentals, and then planned giving and foundations. I remember the, when it struck me for the very first time, it didn't, how dare I, it struck Nancy and myself for the very first time that congregations could be in our wills. And there are, you know, there are congregations that I don't think, hopefully they won't be surprised upon our passing, but they might be able to, to I don't know, take all the kids out for ice cream or something. But to plan giving and foundations, you know, is, is your church in your will? Is, are people actually talking about that, the people in leadership positions? So these are the five fingers of finance. You can add more. You can, I hope you don't lose a finger, um, but the, the, these matter and, and they matter for the keeping well of your facilities and grounds, the life of the church that needs to be talked about. Are, are people reporting at the end of every quarter, at the end of every week? Everyone does it differently, but somehow the people need to know from the New Testament, it's all over there. Paul wrote those 13 letters. I think half of them at times are related to his, the challenges with money. And so in also in the Johannine writings and the Petrine writings, they all speak of, of money. So um, don't be shy to talk about it. And I just, again, from personal journey, going to stewards by design, um, coming back home, our offerings went up. We were able to, to lift the lid properly off the conversation and, and it's been happening ever since. And there's great resources out there, but do yeah. begin with prayer. Um, I did want to, I wanted to pitch in and just say that stewardship and plan giving department have a lot of resources to help with, uh, on, in all of these areas. And I do hope you'll reach out to us because that's what we're there for. Sorry to interrupt. Before, no, before the slide goes down, don't make the assumption that people know this. Don't make the assumption that children know when they become adults that a tithe would be a nice thing and it's places in the Bible and the history of the church to support it. Teach financial stewardship education. Teach facilities and grounds. Tell them about the boiler. Tell them about the parking lot. Um, maybe not at enormous length because some people might tune out quite quickly, but um, tell the story of your facilities and grounds and of your finances. Yeah. And when it comes to tithes and, off tithes and offerings, things are changing. People aren't carrying cash. So you can get uh, square terminal devices and all of a sudden people can give again because that's how they buy literally everything nowadays. And it's important to remember at the back end of this uh, plan giving, 90% of all major gifts given are end of life gifts. 50% of all Canadians don't have wills. So even if you don't invite us to come and tell them they ought to have a will, do remember that people ought to have a will, not just for their charitable giving sake, but for the sake of their families. It's a horrible thing to die without a will. So, you know, definitely these are all, um, and, and, and there's lots of other things across the, this, this whole area in which we're very happy to help. And I do hope you'll contact us. 
just the celebrations, uh, the congregation I'm at has an annual offering at its anniversary. It just turned 70. It's a big, big thing, uh, the anniversary offering. Other churches, that's maybe not their thing. Um, I go back to Westminster, Calgary. I can remember every date there. Uh, February 12th, 1989, the congregation became a community. January 10th, 1988, it worshipped for the first time in a house. So there's January 10th, the first time the congregation ever worshipped. February 12th, the, the, it, it became a church. It, it then moved in March 31. It moved into another one, April 25th. And uh, I, just those, I just picked those because they're in my mind. And the congregation here, uh, April 19th, 1953, uh, with thanks to Glenview Church and the Presbytery of East Toronto and, the, you know, those dates and milestones and, and the anniversaries not only of the congregation, but as but of people's lives. Um, you know, we, we've had several people here uh, turn 90 years old and we're not taking advantage of everything. They were at the initiative of of not they weren't they it was a point of celebration but they we, we said we'd, we'd like to do a little something and uh, all the celebrations of of space and of people um reflect on the impact of the building on the community how uh, when this congregation was established it, its thing was a church for the community now if you come to this community you can you can't really find it um but still we find ways but but do celebrate the milestones, the anniversaries of the place, of the people, of the congregation. And thanks be to God for the blessing that is the facilities and grounds. Thanks be to God for the, the sense of, of we've, we've had this for this long, for this purpose. Um, and and I, uh, I love cake, um, the corner piece, <laughs> but do find ways to, and even as, as, the challenges get great that this I, I'm in a very large building here and it's it's a challenge, but it's a good building and it's doing God's work. Um, yeah, the blessing more than the burden. Um, amen. Oh, thank you so much, Kirk. So uh, first of all, uh, Jen or Maggie, are there any questions uh, in the chat? We're going to open the microphones for conversation in a minute. Um, just uh, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask to uh, Kirk personally, but uh, does anyone have any questions from the chat? No. All righty. Well, uh, feel free to open up your microphones, and uh, and if you have a question, just chirp in, and we'll uh, we'll we'll try to answer the question. Hi. Hi. Well, I if if. If I could take the floor just to say again, I see your faces. I wish I could hug you through this, uh, this screen. So thank you to those who have, who have joined today. Thank you very much. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, this presentation was made available through Presbyterian Sharing. And you're very much invited to contact myself or Karen Plater or Maggie Young or uh, Jen DeCombe at the church offices. And uh, if you would like to reach out to Kirk, if you have additional questions for him, there's his contact information on the screen. I see people uh, sending you thanks via the chat. And uh, you're very welcome, everyone. All right. Well, we went a little long, but I think there was a lot of content and it was all very rich. So thank you so much for coming, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. And this marks the end of our Money Matters series. So uh, thank you, Kirk, for finishing us off with a big bang. Um, and uh, this was a, a series that we offered, but um, we're looking at uh, producing more series in the fall. So are there things that ministry topics that you would like to learn about that you would find helpful uh, to support your ministry and mission? Uh, please do let us know. We're always looking um, to hear from the church to see what would be helpful. Uh, and, and as uh, Jim mentioned, please feel free to contact us. We're here to support you, walk alongside you, pray for you, uh, be a support in ministry. And also the squeaky and, wheel gets the grease. You're not prioritized based on anything other than you asked. So for heaven's <laughs> sakes, please call. It's the easiest way to get prioritized in this joint. Just tell us you'd like some help. We'll be right there. Absolutely.
Take care. Wonderful. Bye, everybody. Well, thank you, Kirk. Bye. It was great to see you, and thank, good to see everyone. Have a wonderful summer. Many blessings on you all. Um, um, may you enjoy yeah. warm weather and lots of fun with family and friends. Thank you. Good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Thank you.